In this lecture, I'm going to cover seaweed growth and survivorship in relation to abiotic factors. And this is the second lecture in abiotic factors. Remember, if you recall, our stress concept where we're looking at the severity, duration, the number and frequency of exposure to stress. In this lecture, we're covering temperature and salinity. These are two stresses that can commonly occur in combination. And these two stresses can together have a much greater effect than if they were just experienced singly. So we're looking here at that combination. If we look at this plot here, which shows the rocky shore, and it shows just how these stresses can interact. On a hot day, we can have evaporation, rising temperatures in rock pools, as well as increasing salinity, which is a lot of water from the pool. We may have rain, which brings with it fresh water that can rapidly alter the conditions within the shore. The tides bring back the oceanic conditions. Waves bring stochastic, random stresses that can hit the rocky shore. But wave exposure generally tends to be fairly consistent between sheltered and exposed. The subtitle is this area here in blue is generally much more consistent with its conditions. Temperature and salinity fluctuate very, very little. When we look at the Eulitoral, the intertidal zone, the changes there can be a lot more random a lot more stochastic, unpredictable, and often very rapid with respect to change. We know clearly that temperatures get cooler towards the poles. That means over large latitudinal gradients, seaweeds have developed adaptations that allow them to live in these different regions. Temperature can fluctuate on annual variability over time, as well as increasing with warming trends. So species must be able to deal with not only the spatial component of temperature, but also the temporal component of temperature fluctuation. Over an annual cycle, of course, we see the higher temperatures, especially in the northern, in the northern parts of Europe, during our summer months of July, August, September, which coincides with large amounts of light. If you recall from the previous lecture, 90% of all light falls between April and September. That coincides with the major growing season of many agro species. Here we have a plot that shows just how temperature can vary at a very high frequency. We have tied out, which is the orange blocks, the blue shaded blocks tied in and then tied out again. We can see here the orange line is the temperature, air temperature, above one meter above high water mark. The dark orange line shows the temperature which is in the astrophilum zone, so kind of mid to low shore. And we see here that when the tide is out, the air temperature is fairly low near the astrophilum zone. I don't think the two temperature sensors are calibrated well to, to one another, so that's why we've got a bit of variability. However, this one does not change, but if we see what happens in the astrophilum zone as the tide comes in, we have a massive increase in temperature rising from about eight and a half eventually to 10.5 degrees. That shows that temperature can change in minutes. And in the winter, we see warmer sea temperatures than air temperatures. In the summer, it's the opposite way around where we see cooler sea temperatures. And we see cooler sea temperatures, but warmer air temperatures. So it's the opposite way around in the summer months. And that rapid change here is a major stressor in intertidal species. Salinity, on the other hand, can also vary over very, very fast time scales. Rock pools are highly stressful environments that can change very rapidly. Here we have a thematic diagram showing some of the different scenarios that could change the salinity within a pool. During low tide, if we have heavy or light rain, we usually see a freshening of the pool as rainwater starts to accumulate, displacing the salt water and mixing and diluting the concentration of salts. However, when tide comes back in and the pool is reconnected to the ocean 
we see a very, very rapid change in salinity going back to what's known as fully oceanic. With high temperatures or low temperatures, we see slow increases in salinity as water evaporates from the pool and again rapid changes back to what the, um, the fully oceanic conditions as this pool becomes connected with the ocean. So we see again rapid changes, complex changes, changing the chemistry in terms of salinity in the area. But what does that mean for seaweed? Well, looking at temperatures, some studies have found that seaweeds are quite resilient to low water temperatures, but not quite resilient to extremes of high temperatures. So for example, a Luning paper, which he co-authored with Freshwater in 1988, found that 6 out of 49 species did not survive freezing temperatures, but none of those species survived temperatures greater than 30 degrees. It shows that high temperature adaptation can be difficult to deal with, for some species of seaweed, but they tend to be okay going down to low temperatures. Kelps, for example, have a very, very restricted maxima, about five, 15 to 18 degrees centigrade, and that's because they're found within that stable environment and protected from area temperatures, so they don't often experience anything greater than them. So they have a very, very narrow thermal tolerance, which we can see here in some species of kelp that they tend not to grow terribly well at high temperatures. Their growth is slower or truncated or even distorted. Some species on the other hand, such as Roma, Roma adapted species like Saccharida polycides, grow exponentially better in higher temperatures, giving them an extreme competitive advantage in those environments where it's found. If we look at survivorship of Antarctic stenothermic Rhodophyta, these are species that are very, very intolerant of temperature change. We see that the vast majority of these Antarctic species do not survive. In fact, none of them survived at temperatures of 5 degrees. They are very, very well cold adapted. So their upper thermal limit is very, very narrow. Okay. Now this one here, Plocamion cartilaginium, this were a red species here, shows that it can actually form very well adapted to certain areas where it's found. These well adapted groups are called ecotypes. And Luning in 1984 found that this particular species in the North Sea had an upper temperature range of 23 degrees. So they have become very well adapted to the areas where they're found. Even though it's the same species, they've got different niches and different thermal tolerances. Key to temperature is that if you are exposed to a stochastic or random temperature event, you will find it difficult to deal with. This example here by Todd and Lewis in 1984 shows what happens when kelps are exposed at low tide and when that low tide, that extreme low tide, interacts with extremely low air temperatures, you can have a very, very high level of mortality. And this has been observed in some areas around the world as well. So you, people have to keep an eye on the actual frequency, the, uh, the level of severity and the level of stress that occurs because that is really important. If it's outside of your normal thermal tolerance, you will succumb and potentially die. So that's a, a good example of what can happen at extreme temperatures. And that only might take a couple of occurrences for this to cause widespread loss of species. Now, in salinity, we're looking at how species can adapt. Now, pumping ions, creating osmo um, lights or osmoregulation can be very energetically expensive. So what happens when the seawater gets fresher or saltier? is that you have to actively pump in and out solutes. What you can't do is pump in or out water. Water will move across the membranes and cell walls by themselves. What you can do is control the solute concentration within your cells. If you lose your water, 
Your cell membrane will detach from the cell wall and you become plasma-like. And that is a major problem for some species of algae, especially when they're exposed rapidly to salinity change. You will be isotonic, you will be in balance with the external water concentration, but if you're high in a hypertonic environment, you find yourself that you're turgid, that you are taking in water, and that you are really pressing against your cell wall. And that can be a problem as well, because it could cause damage to cells and the organelles within. Here we show an example of how organisms can deal with salinity change by regulating the concentration of solute or osmoregulation in their cells. So for example, if salinity increases, gets saltier, organisms may increase the amount of organic solutes within their cells by synthesizing these. Alternatively, they may start pumping in elements from the salt from outside or ions from outside into their cells in order to deal with these, with these concentrations. So that's important, is that they can do two different mechanisms. They can either synthesize solute or they can transport them in. If you experience a decrease in salinity, you will have to get rid of the solute within your cells, otherwise you're going to find that water is rushing in and causing increased turgor and maybe damage to your membranes. So these two mechanisms pumping, actively pumping, is illustrated here in this over Lactuca experiment from Dixon in 1982. So two sets of plots. So we've got the, bra the um, blue box around the outside, excuse me, shows a variable. So we have here osmoregulation, turgor pressure, and potassium ions. And then going down in columns, we have two different kind of treatments of these, of these particular samples. The first one is a sinusoidal gradual change in salinity. The other one is a rapid, abrupt change in salinity. The sinusoidal change is really giving the organism time to track the external condition, whereas the abrupt change, the box, is not. It's just uh, dumping them in and seeing whether there's any lag or which processes actively are very fast or very slow. Are they synthesizing or are they transporting? So if we look at some of the plots, we see that turgor pressure in the slow sinusoidal system is fairly well regulated across it. But if we dump them in, they still experience rapid changes. They're not quite able to regulate as effectively as they do in the sinusoidal chain. That implies that there are some active mechanisms going on to control the turgor pressure, but it cannot, con it cannot deal with such abrupt massive change. That could be a problem for a particular species. If we look at potassium ions, and we have here two lines on these plots, we have a black dots and white dots. The white dots show an experiment that was conducted in light, so that the over can photosynthesize, and the black dots show an experiment that was conducted in the dark, so it can't, so it's relying on its energetic reserves. So in the light, we can see good tracking of the amount of potassium ions. They're actually transporting them in to deal with the external salinity in the dark, that they're able to transport them out, but then they're hit, they're unable to transport them back in, indicating it's a highly energetic pathway. So it's a lot of energy required to regulate the external salinity. In the abrupt condition, we see dramatically rapid transportation, indicating that they can literally shed the, from the potassium very quickly. But as we come here, We see that the um, both light and dark are similar, but when we reach the next change, the experiment then puts them back in, we see that in the light treatment they're able to transport them in at a fairly rapid rate and then shed them very quickly. But there's a little bit of lag there indicating that it takes time, so the intake is being limited by something. In the dark experiment, we see nowhere near the same level. So they're relying on the energy reserved in order to deal with this and they transport it out. Over time, obviously, they would be unable to do, deal with that in that mechanism because they just don't have the energy to do so. So that is essentially showing that salinity regulation in seaweed is expensive. 
they need energy to do it. They need light. And for light, it's quite difficult. But over is a very well adapted species found in a large variety of brackish water and so on. So we see a bad geographic effect of salinity. We can use a case study like the Baltic Sea, where we see a very, very neat decline in fresh water as we head toward Denmark and it becomes saltier. So this very clear relationship gives rise to a neat large-scale mesocosm that we can use to look at salinity responses in communities rather than looking at the individual responses as we would do in an experiment. At this point here we start to get way um, below 20 PSU, very fresh in this area, saltier in this area and we see a large drop up in a number of marine species around that area there. So if we look at this study here, which is by Schubert et al. in 2011, they collated quite a few bits of data from different studies and found that a very, very similar trend in macroalgal species dropped off with salinity. So indicating that living in brackish or freshwater environment is incredibly difficult for macroalgae. They are very well adapted to saltwater environments and that so very few of them can deal with the energetic constraints of living in salt water. So that brings me now to DMSP. DMSP is a very important molecule that's synthesized by algal cells, both uh, phytoplankton and some macroalgal species. This can turn into DMS through the grazing of the cell or the death of the cell or it can be emitted from the cell itself. DMS is a vitally important component of cloud condensation nuclei as well as the sulfur cycle in the ocean. So DMSP is vitally important in maintaining the Earth's climate and lots of research has been done on DMSP. And DMSP essentially means dimethyl sulfonyopropionate, a really simple word to say. Now, DMSP is interesting and important, and it comprises the recommended reading for this particular lecture in the form of a paper by Van Alstein and Puglisi in 2007, which is on the reading list. The role of DMSP in macroalgae can vary. Some species use it as an osmoregulator, regulator, a solute in con controlling internal salinity concentration, and it's been found to act as an antifreeze. It's been found quite common in polar algae. Some organisms can use it as a secondary energy source or storage. It can be a methyl group donator. It can act as pigment protection or anti herbivore compound. So DMSP is an example of a metabolite that is produced in a variety of different ways for to achieve these different objectives for the algae. So it's well worth reading about DMSP because it's a really neat case study on how species can respond to all of these variable about the stress factors.